Alright, so I didn't really uh, prepare anything in particular to say here. Uh, I didn't really think I needed to with how many times I've seen The Shining at this point. I think I talked about it in some other video, like around the time we started this. But, um, uh, yeah, with this whole 4K restoration release thing, uh, it's something that kind of just snuck up on me. Like, I kind of found out about it by accident. <laughs> Um, and then once I did hear about it, I just automatically assumed, well, it's not going to be, you know, anywhere in this area or anything like that. Um, but then I was, I think I was checking the time for another movie, and I just happened to see that it was going to be an option, um, for a couple of days within the week. Um, so I figured, why not go, the tickets were only five dollars. Um, why not? If you, and if I, when I saw it, uh, because I gave them my Regal card, uh, you got 237 bonus points, as in room 237, which is clever in a way. So, um, so yeah, and it was in the smallest theater we have. It's only in, it's only got like four rows. Weirdly enough, it's the movie I, it's the theater I saw both uh, Hereditary and Midsummer in. So it's like it's like this weird sort of horror theater by accident. Um, and with the theater being so small, um, no matter where you sit, even if you're in, even if you're in the back row where I usually am. Um, the screen is pretty much still right in your face. <laughs> um, so it was actually kind of the perfect theater, especially since it's so small and kind of claustrophobic a little bit. Um, and I was wondering what we were going to be doing as far as crowd size goes, because around here, the re-releases really don't do much. Um, I think we had that, um, back in 2014 when we had the Saul re-release, the 10-year anniversary release for a week, I think that entire week... Uh, nobody went to it. Like, nobody showed up for it, and it was here for an entire week. Um, so needless to say, not only was I shocked that we actually got it, um, and the fact that I went on the second night, uh, which was in the middle of the week, um, it was pretty much full. And of course, it's, it's kind of easy to be full in that theater, because it's such a small theater, but still, um, it, it, it's still surprising it was that full. And then that's the thing where it comes in, uh, what it's like watching a movie like The Shining with a crowd in 2019, even, because I did, this is actually my second time seeing this in a theater, because I saw it back in 2014, uh, which I'm sure I've mentioned a few times, where um, the Art House Theater um, down that way was like doing a Kubrick festival that I went to some of the movies for, and that was one of them. Um, and this one, I mean, obviously you could tell was a little different because it was, um, the restoration, which is w one thing where, y yeah, obviously, visually, um, it did have, it, it had a more clear look to it, but at the same time, they somehow made it look, like, almost kind of old-fashioned, too. Um, I'm not quite sure how they pulled that off, but it's like, the first thing I immediately wondered about uh, going in was the sort of exterior shots, especially the opening scene. Um, because I mean, obviously, you know, the interior of the hotel with, uh, like, the production design and how precise it all is did really stand out. Uh, and every now and then there was still something in there. Um, that I didn't, some things that I hadn't caught before, even regardless of how many times I've seen the movie. Then again, that's kind of, that's kind of just the theater experience in general. When I went with my brother back in June to see Forrest Gump in the theater, which is something neither one of us had done before, even Forrest Gump, uh, a movie we've known front to back since childhood, I was seeing things that I, and hearing things I had never noticed. Um, but the, like I was talking about, the exterior shots especially, um, do feel, like, so incredibly massive, um, which is really interesting given that, it, given that it's a movie about, like, kind of a, a closed-in feeling. Um, but I do also think that it's, like, in a sense you can say it's an interesting contrast because there's the whole thing where we see the really wide open spaces whenever they're going to uh, the Overlook, or when we do see the Overlook from an exterior shot, a lot of the time it's from a distance, so we see the whole damn thing, like the whole surrounding area around it also. But it's like, while it's, you know, kind of doing, doing that thing where it's a contrast, where you get all these wide open spaces when you're actually inside, regardless of how big the hotel is, it's gonna feel like you're closed in. But something that I do think still works in that effect, um, to where it's not much of a contrast, is that it's kind of showing you the isolation too because pretty much every time we get one of those you know 
big wide shots of the big wide open spaces. Um, their car is usually the only sign of life in those shots. Um, and there's, like, the the most we get is, like, the parking lot at the overlook like, before everybody's left. Um, but even then, it just feels, everything, everything just looks so deserted and distant um, before anything has even happened yet, um, before they're even left there. And then once they are, um, after an abrupt uh, cut to a title card that just kind of jumps ahead a month, um, you've kind of, you've kind of already got that, like, we don't even need that extra month. I think that's why I, I like the time jump so much, and that it is that much time. Um, and so, yeah, and then, of course, talking about the interiors also, uh, when I was talking about, like, there's obviously, you know, stuff like the carpet and just the little details all around, uh, what the gold room looks like and everything, but then there's also the stuff like, uh, like the use of the mirrors, um, where it's, like, so, something I didn't notice uh, till relatively recently, actually, which is kind of embarrassing to say given how many times I've seen it, is the fact that um, there's always mirrors present when um, Jack is talking to, like, the ghosts or whatever you want to call them, like when he's talking to Lloyd or when he's talking to uh, Grady in the bathroom. Um, there's always, like, a wall of mirrors behind him, uh, which could be saying one thing or another about that. I, th I think I went in I've gone into this before. Um... What I really love about this movie is the fact that there's really no explanation. Every, pretty much everybody has their own explanation. Um, but I actually, and I think this was a reason I was really against that Room 237 movie, that documentary, um, about the people with all their different theories. Because not only was just like that 98% idiocy, <laughs> um, and just totally completely pointless, um, I I just love approaching The Shining as a movie with no explanation. I think that's what makes it uh, the freaky thing that it is, and I think it pretty much takes away from it uh, trying to explain exactly, like, are they actually ghosts? Is Jack hallucinating? And it's like, what's he doing in the picture in 1921? And it's like the fact that there's no, there's nothing. Um, who's the dude giving the blowjob in the bear suit? Um, the fact that we just only ask why, um, I think is what makes that so terrifying, especially seeing it through the eyes of Wendy, um, and we're like, it's just the confusion is adding to it, um, and the disorientation of it, and I do think that's, um, that's also a testament to Shelley Duvall's performance, which I know has gotten some hate, um, there's, there's, like, there's so many negative things going on with that performance, because it's like, there are people that just didn't, that didn't like it, like, they think she's genuinely bad in it, um, and then there's the other side of it, where it's hard to look at it as a performance, when you know that, like, Kubrick was practically torturing her psychologically, and was, like, really fucking her up, doing all those, all those scenes, and doing them over and over again, and just being really harsh with her in general, um, particularly the scene when she's backing up the steps, and she just seems so tired and exhausted by everything that's been happening, um, but I still think there is, like, a genuine performance in there, especially the scene, uh, when she discovers the manuscript and exactly what it is, like, it's, it really sells the horror of that moment, I think. The score also, definitely, um, but I do think she really sells that, but talking about the score while we're at it, um, there is a whole thing about... I, I could see it being a bit of a grading score to some people. I actually found myself worrying about that a little bit watching it in a full theater, because um, it's like super, super clear in a theater now, um, especially uh, in this format. But I, I don't know. I still think it just really, really adds to just that whole dreaded factor. And of course, you know, if there's going to be one genre that can be accused of having many overbearing music scores, even when they necessarily don't have to be, it would probably be the horror genre. Um, but, so, I mean, unless we're talking, like, you know, lifetime dramas or something. But uh, horror also um, is like the... But it's... Yeah, and the way that really came through, because I've noticed when talking about... When you hear about it being, like, a restoration, and you think how, how clear it must look and, like, what it's going to look like, um, but I noticed, this is also, when I started making the, uh, back when I started making the transition from DVD to Blu-ray, 
Um, everybody was, you know, when Blu-ray was first coming out, it was like, oh my god, the picture is so much clearer and all that. Um, but the one thing that I've always noticed, um, and I still know, even today when I watch movies on Blu-ray, it's still something that always stands out to me and I love really um, getting immersed in is the sound. Um, and just how, how much clearer that is. Like, it's insane how much, like... Like, I was talking about kind of with... It's a weird comparison to make when we're talking about The Shining, but uh, when we saw Forrest Gump a few months ago, um, there's, like, ten songs on the Forrest Gump soundtrack that I never knew were on the soundtrack until I saw it in a theater because they're so far in the background. Um, and that's something where, like, like I said, e even if it's uh, restoration or just really speaking of the theater experience in general... Um, you can, you can really tell the difference, um, when you can notice how good the sound is. Um, I just watched, uh, Overlord again the other night, uh, with surround sound, and it's something that just really is a really kind of overlooked factor in just how much it can bring a movie to life by itself. Um, and it was really doing wonders with The Shining also, as you can probably imagine. Um, especially being even clearer than usual, so, um, and of course, you know, I've always been all about, uh, the Nicholson performance, I know some, he gets some criticism for being a bit over the top and hammy, and we know how King felt about, uh, him being chosen, and the fact that he basically played it like he was insane the whole time, I don't, I don't necessarily think he plays it like, he doesn't necessarily seem like a guy that's on the verge of going crazy, unless you just kind of, or seeing other Nicholson performances in him when you see him, like, smile or something. Um, I, j I just think he's he's kind of a dick. Uh, and that's really... And, that, and I think that's what people see when they take it as, oh, that guy could snap at any minute. Um, yeah, I, d I, don't, I don't think he was playing it as a guy that could snap at any minute and murder people. Just a guy that could snap at any minute and be a, a total dick. Um, and so... And leading into it, like, when, when he gets pissed at Wendy about walking in on him while he's riding, it's like, you can't really tell if that's the cabin fever already setting in, or if that's just the way Jack was already. Um, and like I said, I can see where that could be kind of an issue, especially if you want to make Jack seem like he's not at all on the verge of snapping in some way, but the, I think another reason that doesn't bother me is the fact that the rest of the movie is doing such a good job of uh, really kind of stretching it out um, and really letting the feelings settle in more and more the longer it goes on. And that's what, I, like I said, I, re I really shouldn't um, think about it this way, but yeah, watching it with a crowd, it is one of those cases where I couldn't help but like sort of feel the... Um, I don't know if it was a restlessness or what it was, but I, I would wondered how many people had seen the movie at all and how many mo people had seen the movie recently. Like, if maybe people had seen the movie forever ago and they just remember, like, the last 20 minutes or so, um, forgetting just how much build-up there is to setting in the whole feeling of it building and building and we're really they're kind of showing us almost in real time with the exception of like the time jump title cards um a descent into insanity uh and it just really feels like it the more it goes on also and of course you know the more times you see the movie the shorter it feels um for the past you know five years or so now it's just flown by for me every time i see it but uh but it still kind of has like that you know, kind of epic feel to it, um, even though it's within the span of, like, we, we get the one-month time jump, but then it's, like, you know, in, in, in days, uh, instead of the bigger time jumps, um, but it still feels like it gradually gets there until it's finally, like, you can, you can kind of feel a big turning point in that moment where Jack looks directly into the camera, and addresses Lloyd, and it's like from that point on you can sense uh, that we have gotten to this point very slowly, and this is the turning point, and then from here on out, Jack is a different person. <laughs> um, and, the, and the whole thing about, uh, I, I noticed also uh, the not blinking thing, uh, particularly with Jack on the steps um, as he's following one day up and with the bat, um, but it took me a while to notice that um, the sort of 
ghosts that he talks to don't blink either. Like, I don't think Lloyd blinks, and I don't think Grady does either. Um, and that's one of those things that it's like... Like I said, I, I'd always noticed it was there in Jack, but I'd never really thought to look for it in the other characters. Um, and so, like, that's always there, and it sort of leaves that... Not only is it just sort of, you know, naturally unnatural to use an, an oxymoron or whatever, but uh, also... Um, it's sort of like an anticipation, like if you do notice that, you kind of wait for it. Uh, like, may maybe that moment where they blink is in there, I just missed it before, and you just keep anticipating. <laughs> um, and, and that really kind of adds to those scenes also. Um, another thing about watching the Grady scene in a full theater in 2019, and it's, it's a line that I sometimes forget about, um, I think because it's kind of from out of nowhere, but it was weird to watch this movie that is known for being, like, really claustrophobic, really unsettling, and just gradu gradually takes us, um, into this descent into madness. And I think the most tense the theater felt was the scene in the bathroom where Grady refers to Halloran in a certain way. <laughs> <laughs> and that's like that's the moment where you felt everybody get really uncomfortable, um, and I think that's like, and I, I've never quite like part of it. I feel like is the fact that it just kind of seems to come from out of nowhere in this movie, uh, <laughs> but then there's also the whole thing of like, well, maybe it's trying to show us how Grady's like you know from a different time or something, um, even though I believe the the original murders and then now are supposed to only be like 10 years apart or something. Um, but then there is, um, uh, yeah, and it's like, maybe it's also showing like the, just sort of the hatred that's in the spirits or the hotel itself or whatever you want to say that is. Um, cause like I said, I, I don't, I don't look for an explanation in regards to are these actual ghosts is the whole thing, the hotel or whatever the hell. Um, I just let it all run with it, but, uh, yeah, so, um, I, I guess I'm probably getting close to the end of this, um, and there's also, also just the whole beginning, also talking about, uh, how much build-up we have, um, the whole tour of the hotel, uh, at the beginning, with Howard and speaking of him, um, there is, um, I, I could see people maybe seeing it as a bit of, um, you know, too long for an opening or whatever. Um, but that is until you realize that they're basically laying out the climax. Like, when when we're getting a tour of the hotel, it's not just, you know, some, you know, tedious scene when they're just sort of showing us everything and all that. They're like, almost every room we go into that's introduced to us plays a major part in this, or especially plays a major part in this in the climax. Um, and knowing that layout from the get-go, um, is kind of the unsung hero of how tense we feel during the class because it feels like we're in a place that we know um so it kind of feels like when danny's running away from him how exactly is he going to get away from him until the the maze really serves its purpose uh in a really incredible and iconic way so um yeah, I think uh, that's about all I can say about uh, this whole restoration. Like, I didn't say much about the restoration itself, but it's like, I mean, yeah, it's what you expect it to be. Uh, it looks better. It sounds better. Uh, you you would probably see things if you haven't had you hadn't seen it in a theater before. Um, seeing it in this really massive way really brings out a lot of the stuff that you may not necessarily catch on to. You know, watching it on TV or whatever. Um, and I feel like, that, like I said, I've already gotten to it twice. I feel like they play it in theaters a lot. Um, I think Fathom just did something for it again a couple of years ago. Um, so, and then it'll be coming up on an anniversary next year, so I wouldn't be surprised if they're doing it again already. Um, but obviously, the one right now was, I think, apart from the restoration itself, was uh, the release was meant to coincide with uh, Doctor Sleep coming out next month. Um, which should be interesting in itself. Uh, I'm like halfway through the book or so. Um, and I'm curious how Mike Flanagan's going to adapt this. Like, I trust him. Um, but I am very curious. I do think it's very interesting that uh, people keep asking about, like, this is a sequel to the book, which obviously has a lot of different outcomes and a lot of different things going on in it than Kubrick's movie does. So the big question was, is, Doctor, is the movie Doctor Sleep going to be a book sequel or 
a sequel to Kubrick's movie. Um, and I, I think the answer was a little bit of both. Uh, so I'm really curious how that's going to translate. So um, I guess we'll see what happens. But that, that did get me uh, a little more hyped for it, even if I'm kind of... My interest is kind of going in and out uh, on the book. It's kind of trying to do a lot of things, but uh, we'll we'll see what happens. Um, there's no there's nothing too like you know uncaring about it in regards to doing multiple things at once. Like it feels like it'll obviously come together at some point, but uh, but yeah, as a movie translation, I am very curious to see where that goes. And yeah, um, the marketing is working a little bit since um, I got a little more hype for it after this. Uh, second theatrical viewing of The Shining, so, yeah, um, so this is also, um, just to kind of, you know, kick off the month of October a little bit, because then I'm going to start doing the, uh, horror versus, I was originally going to do, um, another versus and the review video that I never got around to, but now that we're kind of in the October vibe, I'll just save those for November, so, uh, though I do think I'm going to put Downton Abbey on the, uh, Joker video, so, there, then that's, uh, two days from now. Um, I'm actually getting ready to do the first verses like right after this. So, uh, and then after that will be the Joker review and all that. So, um, and then the next horror verses right after that. And that'll be what this entire month is, as you know. So, um, until all that stuff, uh, I think that's pretty much all I have to say on the, 